from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, and thank you for coming. I'm Sam Litzinger from uh, WAMU's The Animal House and uh, CBS News. I, uh, I live near the Potomac River down by Mount Vernon, and we get a lot of birds down there, um, some of which I recognize, some of which I think I recognize, some of which I have no idea what they are, other than being big or maybe oranges or, or looking for dinner or something like that. It would be very handy to shrink David Sibley down to about three inches so as to be able to put him in my jacket pocket as I walk around the woods and fields. And then when I spot an interesting bird, I could just pull out mini David and ask, what's that? And mini David would say, that's a Wilson storm petrel, or that's a northern flicker, or even, that's a chickadee, don't you know anything? <laughs> then I would thank mini David and I would put him back in my pocket until I spotted the next bird. Sadly, this would be both tedious and annoying for David, so we won't be saying, honey, I shrunk the ornithologist anytime soon. Fortunately, while we might, ha might not have a small David Sibley, we still have a big but pretty handy David Sibley book, which is The Sibley Guide to Birds, first published in 2000. Many of you know it. Many of you have, I hope, the new copy. If you don't, it is available. It's updated with additional information. Um, David, of course, loves birds, but today is taking some time away from them to be here with us humans and teach us a little more about his flying friends. We can have absolutely no better expert. I'm very much looking forward to him and expect you are too. Would you please welcome David Sibley? Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and what a great crowd. Um, thank you all for coming indoors on a beautiful uh, summer afternoon. Okay. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming indoors on a beautiful summer afternoon. Um, and uh, I am here to talk to you about my book about birds. Um, I started bird watching when I was very young. Um, there we go. Um, and my father's an ornithologist, so that probably had something to do with my early interest in birds. Um, but for as long as I can remember, I, I enjoyed drawing and I enjoyed birds, and the two things went together perfectly. Um, Drawing is just a great way to learn about something, and there's so much to learn about birds. So for me, birding and drawing have always been one thing, a combination that um, I could never separate. Um, this is a drawing of a peregrine falcon uh, that I did in uh, 1969 when I was about eight years old. Uh, it's copied from a, one of my father's bird books. Um, and here's me at about age 13. Uh, my father, being an ornithologist, could offer lots of opportunities to me, like bird banding. So I learned bird banding when I was very young. And that, I look back, as one of the really important aspects of my early bird study, the opportunity to hold a bird in your hand, to feel it, to get that extra sense involved is so much richer than just looking at it through binoculars. So a lot of my early birding experiences was actually holding the birds in my hand, feeling them, the, the incredible amount of life and energy that's packed into that little tiny body, and they're so small. This, this is a sharp-tailed sparrow. It probably weighs about 13 grams, half an ounce. So to put that in perspective, you could put two in an envelope and mail them anywhere for one stamp. <laughs> And kinglets, birds like ruby crown kinglets, are um, much smaller, six grams, five grams. Um, imagine putting five in an envelope for one stamp. Um, so that experience of, of feeling the energy, the life, and the, the seeing the birds up close and then being able to release them and watch them fly away was really magical. This, all the bird banding experiences that I had as a kid were just great. Um, and I also, early on, had an interest in books, or at least in 
gathering information and compiling it. This is an early um, example of a book project that I worked on as a teenager, um, The Warblers of Connecticut. And this is a limited edition of one, um, <laughs> made with a typewriter and colored pencils and glue and photographs. Um, but sketching was the one constant in my, my birding experience. So I was always, when I was birding, I always had a notebook or a sketchbook and tried to draw the birds that I saw. And um, drawing, it really is a, just a way to focus your attention. Uh, for me, that's, that's what it was. My drawing has always been about information. Um, so it's real, it's true scientific illustration. And looking at a bird like this white-winged crossbill, um, it was, this is the first white-winged crossbill I ever saw, so I, I could have identified it with seeing the white on the wings and the crossbill, and you know it's a white-winged crossbill, check it off on your life list and move on. But in order to do this relatively simple sketch, just a pencil outline with a few details added in, there are hundreds of questions that I had to ask, and I've I sometimes describe sketching as being like an interview with the bird. It's a, it's a structure that forces you to, to ask those questions, to look more carefully, to wonder and ask, what shape is the head? How big is the bill relative to the head? Where is the eye? Uh, what shape are the white markings on the wings? And all those questions um, then get translated into pencil lines on the paper. But it's really all about the the process of looking that carefully and asking those questions and learning those things. Once you've gone through all those steps, you really know what that bird looks like. Um, so uh, when people ask me about sketching and, and how to draw birds, I think it's really just about observation and practice, and each sketch is just um, practice for the next one. Uh, and one of the best bits of advice I can give for sketching is um, to think of, just think of each sketch as something that you're never going to look at again. It's just, it's all about learning. <laughs> you're not producing something that you're going to hang on the wall. It's not going to be your Christmas card. It might go in the trash, but you'll learn something from it, and your next sketch will be better, and the next one after that. Um, so this is a photograph of me sitting in the back of a friend's car in Maine, and I'm sketching a northern hawk owl, and we'll get back to that one in a, in a minute, but I'll start with the, um, the first northern hawk owl I ever saw, which was within a few weeks of that white-winged crossbill, so you'll notice a similarity in the style of sketching when I was about 13 years old. So this was one that we saw, I watched it for a few minutes, um, on a family trip, and, um, and then we drove away, and I did these sketches in the car as we were leaving, just to have something to remember it by. Now, seven years later, I had just, well, I had just finished college after almost a year, <laughs> and decided to go bird watching full time. So I left college, and this is the beginning of my full time bird watching. Uh, and sketching. So this hawk owl was wintering in, in Portland, Maine, and this is the first sketch that I did on the first, uh, the, on this day, um, just testing out some lines, testing out some uh, ideas for how to draw it. This is practice. And later that day, after a series of five or so other sketches, several hours of watching and sketching, um, I'm starting to get a better understanding of what a hawk owl looks like and how to draw it. Um, now, I went back three days later and spent several more hours with the same hawk owl, and I did this. This is like the in-depth interview. This is really looking at the bird, asking every question that I can think of, and really getting to know it. And just as an exercise to spend an hour or so on this one sketch, and after that, after learning through that sketch, I was able to do this kind of sketch, which starts then, now that I've got the sort of the, um, the basics, the, the fundamentals of the hawk owl in my mind, I can start to do sketches that 
capture some of the movement, the character, the, the overall shape with just a few lines um, and uh, experiment with more, uh, more subtle things. Now, seven years later, and I've spent those seven years basically bird watching and sketching full time, traveling all over the country, living in a camper van, um, learning as much as I could about birds and drawing. And this is one of the drawings that I did sitting in the back of my friend's car in that photograph in Maine. Um, this, so this is actually a very unusual field sketch for me. This is very detailed. It's really a finished pencil drawing. And part of that is that hawk owls make fantastic subjects for drawing because those of you who have seen hawk owls will know that they just sit still. <laughs> they sit on one branch, one, they'll sit on top of a flagpole, one really prominent perch, and they'll stay there for hours. So you can really set the telescope on it, work on your sketch for five minutes, and look back at the bird and the telescope. It will still be there. Um, so most of my field sketches, I will show, are more like this. Very quick um, pencil drawings. Trying, this is Leech's storm petrels um, drawn from the deck of the Blue Nose Ferry in the Gulf of Maine. And what this represents is probably 45 minutes of watching and maybe five minutes of actually putting pencil on paper. There's a tremendous amount of just looking and five minutes of looking and then some very quick uh, scribbling on the paper, testing some things out, look at the birds some more, look at the sketch, look at the birds, look at the sketch, figure out what's wrong, what I need to change, and then do a little more scribbling. So this is a typical field sketch. And here's another more recent typical field sketch. Um, people often ask me how I can draw a bird in the wild when it's so hard just to see them. And a subject like these hooded warblers were on a path. They were foraging right along the edge of a path in Texas. So I could stand on the path and watch. And almost most of the time, there would be one bird in view. So they were coming and going on the path. But this, again, is probably 15 or 20 minutes of watching and just 90 seconds, maybe, of actual drawing. 90% um, or more of the time involved in a sketch is, is simple observation and thinking about what I'm going to draw. And when I draw something like this, I'm, I'm, each of these sketches builds on everything that I know from the past. So all the warblers that I've drawn before, all of the songbirds that I've drawn before are helping me to draw this. So I have, if, if I was a musician, it would be like practicing chords. I've practiced my chords, and I know how to play all the notes and which ones go together in which sequence. And so I can look at, it, look at a piece of music, look at the bird, and quickly scribble down the, the fundamentals and modify it in just a few places to turn it into a hooded warbler. So that's one way that each sketch helps to uh, inform the next one. So this is one of my more detailed and more scientific field sketches. Um, this is two species of hummingbirds. And I think if this, if I were going to produce a field guide to the identification of these two species of hummingbirds, this is the only illustration that would be needed. It's black-chinned hummingbird and Costa's hummingbird. But this sketch, this outline, shows all of the details that are keys to identifying those species. And any other information that I added to this would distract from the important information, which is the shape of the bill, the proportions of head to body and wings to tail, the shape of the wings, the length of the neck. Those are the details that you really need to look at. And adding color and shading and all this sort of flash to this would distract from the important details that you need to identify the birds. Um, and that thinking really um, helped me when I was planning, the, planning my field guide, um, which I, I spent years thinking about the guide and planning it. And one of the um, important points that I came up with was that 
the more simplified the illustrations can be, um, the easier it is to get the information that you need out of them. So I deliberately set out after, well, it was a long period of trial and error and experimenting, but I eventually settled on the idea of simplifying the illustrations as much as I could so that the, the information that's in there is just the information that's really key to identifying those species. Um, now here's, I'll walk through a, the process of doing one of the paintings that is in the guide. So this is after years in the field watching and sketching birds, then when I go back in the studio, I start um, working on the actual paintings. All I do in the field is pencil on paper. Um, so this is a painting of the, the uh, Queen Charlotte Islands subspecies of sawwet owl, which is um, added to the second edition of the guide. Uh, so I begin with a very simple pencil outline, and this is the first step, just adding, uh, I've already added four or five layers of paint to it, these transparent, translucent layers of paint, and I use gouache, which is opaque watercolor. Um, so I start the painting and adding layers and gradually building up the, the uh, color and the detail of the entire painting. So I'll go through a series of about five slides, and you'll see it will gradually build up. So I'm adding a little bit more depth, a little more detail, starting to add details around the face, using a smaller brush and adding, adding some details all over. Um, starting to add some white around the face, and it, uh, it pulls together a little bit more. And finally, the finished painting, but gradually building up layers of paint over the entire bird. And if I, this should zoom in, so there we go. So zooming in, the, the original paintings that I did for the guide are about three times as big as the reproductions that you see in the book. They're much larger. And when you look closely, they're not really very detailed. There's a level of precision, but not a lot of detail. Um, and I use a fairly large brush. I use quick brush strokes. Um, and I, all of this I've sort of developed um, to work more quickly. Um, and here's another example of a, a species that's added to the second edition of the guide. This is Baikal teal. And it shows at the top the simple pencil outline that I would begin with, and at the bottom the finished painting of a male Baikal teal. Um, now, when I set out to do the second edition of the book, um, I still I have all of the original art from the first edition. So here's three pages from the first edition showing um, several species of doves. So each big sheet of paper, about 15 by 20 inches, shows all of the illustrations that I, um, that I expect to appear on a page in the book. And I looked at... I went through and, and uh, worked on every one of those pages, every single sheet. I checked it. Most of them I made some minor touch-ups for the second edition. Some of them I made major corrections. Um, but I was looking through and, and uh, updating most of the artwork from the first edition and then adding new illustrations to supplement that and new species for the second edition. Now, in the original first edition, when I was painting these full plates, um, I would work on the entire page at once, where I showed the sawwet owl building up gradually layers of paint on that one image. I would work on each of the eight or 12 images of doves on a sheet of paper all at once, mix some gray paint for the shadows, and paint the shadows on all, all of the images at the same time. And mix some reddish brown color and put that wherever it was needed on all of the images. That sort of assembly line process allowed me to um, work more quickly, it was more efficient, and on a good day I could finish um, one whole sheet. Um, and uh, about an hour per illustration is what it takes me to do a, 
uh, painting in the book. Some species take longer, more detailed or more intricate patterns. Some, like crows, take a lot less. Um, but this is, and this will sound funny, but I, um, I don't actually have a lot of patience for painting. <laughs> so I've developed all these, oops, sorry, wow. I've developed all these techniques for um, speeding up the painting process, for making it more efficient um, and getting results quickly so that I can feel like I'm actually moving forward taking another step towards the top of the mountain. Now, when I finished the first edition of the Guide to Birds in 2000, I, um, I did a couple of other bird projects. And then in the mid-2000s, I decided I was interested in another big, another big project, going back to my, my childhood interest in, in books, sort of compiling information. I wanted a project that wasn't birds, but that would give me a lot of the same, uh, the same challenges. And I settled on trees, um, and I did a guide to trees, which was published about um, six years ago. And I found that trees are actually, um, surprisingly, uh, in terms of nature study, it's maybe the one that's most similar to bird study. Um, if you think about other aspects or other groups of uh, organisms in the natural world and studying them. Um, if you want to study butterflies, well, in this part of the world, there are only butterflies around for half the year, and a lot of the species require a tremendous effort to find. Um, they're in very local places. They only fly at certain times of the year. If you want to study say, reptiles and amphibians. You have to go into the woods and really search for them. Mammals, you have to go out at night. Birds and trees are the two kinds of organisms that are around us all the time. We see them every day. We see them from our office windows. We see them from the bus. They're at the post office. Everywhere you turn, there are birds. They're outside your kitchen window, birds and trees. And for me, that was really important for my, my next project, to have something that I could study during the course of my everyday life, and also something that I would be able to use constantly. Um, so that's my, uh, how I ended up doing a guide to trees. And then I found that the, the rewards of it were very similar to what I think of as some of the big rewards of bird study. Um, that it's all, for me, it's, a lot of it is about understanding patterns and getting to know the world around me by learning how things are related, how they link together, how they're similar as well as dissimilar. So this species, the box elder, is really a maple. It's in the same genus. It's, everything about it is a maple, except that it has compound leaves. So a lot of guides to tree identification that are focused on leaves will put it in the section with ashes and walnuts and other species that have compound leaves, but it's really everything else about it is a maple. Um, and this uh, learning about tree identification, um, these two species in this picture, and I'm sorry if you can't uh, see very well from the back, but the, on the left is a gray birch, on the right is a quaking aspen. They're two superficially similar trees that are common along roadsides in the northeast. And in the winter, the easiest way to tell them apart is by their twigs. And once you learn that, you realize that that helps you to distinguish all of the birches from all of the aspens and poplars. All the birches have slender, delicate twigs, and all of the poplars and aspens have thicker, more angular-looking twigs. Um, it's similar to some of the things that I learned about birds, that these, there are these patterns and similarities that run through all the species of birds. These three species here, like all of the small songbirds, they have the same number of lines of streaks on their breast, the same number of rows of feathers. So the patterns on these birds 
are determined by the arrangement of the feathers. They all have exactly the same arrangement of feathers. It's only the markings on the feathers that are different. And here, just like the birches and aspens, as a birder, as a beginning birder, you might learn the difference between herons and cranes. They're both big, gray, long-necked birds, and a lot of people, uh, until you pick up a bird guide and really learn them, you don't notice the difference, but they're fundamentally different. Um, aside from their color and, and overall shape and size, their behavior, their food, their voice, their mig uh, their flocking, uh, their flight, everything about them is fundamentally different. Uh, and their attitude as well. The great blue heron, for those of you who know them, could easily take on those uh, five sandhill cranes. Um, so the other aspect of bird watching that I really enjoy is the, the way it connects me to history, to the bigger picture, um, and it's short-term and long-term history. We have birds constantly coming and going. So the birds that were around a few weeks ago, some species, like prothonotary warbler, have already migrated to South America, Central America, um, and they won't be back until next April. There's constant movement, and species like pileated woodpecker, um, in this area, 40, 30, 40 years ago when I was starting birding, in, I was mostly in Connecticut, but it was a rare bird then. There just weren't very many big trees around. And now, a lot of farmland has grown back to forest. A lot of the suburbs have mature trees. There are a lot of 60, 70, 80 year old trees around now out there just growing in our suburbs and parks and, and um, uh, forests and a lot of pileated woodpeckers. It's a much more numerous bird now than it was 40 years ago. And we see changes like that happening constantly. Species declining, species increasing, ranges shifting. It makes bird watching constantly exciting and interesting. Uh, and the migrations, as I mentioned, like this Blackburnian warbler, it's the um, the constant excitement for bird watchers is uh, what's going to happen next, what's coming tomorrow. Um, and as much as I like trees, they don't quite match that excitement of bird watching <laughs> that um, uh, nobody ever uh, woke up in the morning to look out in their yard out the kitchen window and wondered what trees they would see <laughs> in the yard. But, but those of you with bird feeders probably look out the window every morning and wonder what birds will be there. It's that kind of excitement, that interest, that spirit of discovery that makes birds and bird watching so exciting and engaging, um, along with the academic challenge of identifying them, the, the pleasure of learning, of figuring things out and seeing those patterns, um, and the sense of understanding the the passage of time. But I think of bird watching really as, I think one of the reasons that bird watching has become so much more popular in the last 40 years, and it has grown tremendously in popularity, um, is that the, as our lives have become more and more disconnected from nature, we're in our offices and cars and houses, um, we don't experience nature the way our parents and grandparents did. Most of them were bird watchers living on farms. They didn't call themselves bird watchers, but they marked the change of seasons, the passage of time by the birds. They knew the songs. Um, we don't have that as part of our daily lives anymore, and bird watching gives us an opportunity to do that, to get outdoors. And it's just the excuse, it's the, it's the hook that gets us out there, it's the reason we set the alarm clock for 5 a.m. and actually get up even if it's raining to go out, but the reward is seeing the sunset, seeing the sunrise, um, seeing a migration of dragonflies, seeing a fox, all the other things that happen while we're out there, those other experiences and that understanding that comes from being a part of it is the real reward of bird watching. And 
the bird watching just gives us a sort of structure to get us out there to uh, make that a part of our lives. Um, so uh, I hope that the uh, bird guide helps to uh, introduce you to that world and um, helps to uh, increase your enjoyment of it. And uh, that would make me very happy to know that uh, the guide was helping to get more people outdoors. So thank you. If anyone's brave enough for a question, <laughs> yes? Thank you very much. I appreciated uh, the art and the discussion. Thanks. I wonder, uh, as many of us understand, we're in the midst of a sixth extinction event, and what you foresee for that in relation to North American biodiversity and the birds. Yeah. Um, I have a slightly less pessimistic view of it all, as you might have gathered. I see a, a tremendous number of bird species increasing. Um, what we need, obviously, what we need to worry about are the species that um, are more specialized, the species that require real natural wild habitat. Um, those habitats are disappearing. The, most of the species that are increasing are species like pileated woodpecker, red-tailed hawk, Canada goose, wild turkey, um, species that have adapted to human-modified environments. They live in the suburbs now, and there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of square miles of suburbs for them to occupy. Um, it's the species that require um, real natural habitat that that need our help, and, um, and uh, each species is kind of a different story. The, it's one of the things that makes it so challenging is each species requires a slightly different set of, of um, uh, slightly different kind of help. Um, but uh, some of the common threads are the, are our human rate of consumption of resources and um, uh, preserving land as open space and allowing it to be natural. So those are the two real key issues, I think, that cross many, many species. And um, if we could get a handle on those, there would be a really bright future for uh, all of the birds. Um, but uh, there, there are a lot of species that are doing very well in our, uh, in our suburbs and other um, human-modified environments. So, yeah. I wondered if you'd had a chance to uh, work with uh, Roger Tory Peterson. And I, I wondered if you'd had a chance to work with Roger Tory Peterson and, and were in any way influenced by his art and, and approaches. Yeah, I did. Um, I got to meet Roger Torrey Peterson several times when I was a kid. He lived, I, I grew up in Connecticut, and he lived just 20 miles away. Um, and um, so it, uh, he had a tremendous influence on me, um, both his books and from actually being there as a real person. He, I showed him my sketchbooks on a couple of meetings, and he was very encouraging. Um, and I think uh, maybe his biggest influence was just sort of being there as an example to, to give me the idea that writing a bird guide was a viable career option. Because <laughs> it seemed when I was 12 or 13 years old, people were talking about, you know, he lived just 20 miles away and people were talking about bird guides. and, and with my father being an ornithologist, hanging out with other bird watchers on the weekends, it seemed like everybody wrote bird guides. Just it was just something people do. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, two questions that are slightly related and very quick, I think. One is, 
Do we assume that, can we assume that the birds in your book were all birds that you've seen? Um, almost all of them, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, there were about eight species in the first edition that I hadn't seen when I painted them, and um, there, I haven't counted. There are more, I added a lot of rare species in the second edition, there are more now. And is there, is there any bird that you really wish you, you had seen so that you could get it in the book? Oh, well, yes, all. <laughs> just, just one or two, maybe. As a, as a birder, I wish I had seen all of them. But, um, and yeah, it's very difficult to paint them when I haven't seen them. Um, as I, like with the Sawat Owl painting, I'm building up the layers of paint over the whole bird, and I can kind of visualize how it's going to end up, or I have a vision of the finished painting as I'm putting on each layer. If I haven't seen the bird, if I don't know it very well, Personally, uh, it's harder for me to have that vision of where I'm headed with the painting, so I have to be constantly comparing photographs to what I've painted, and it's a much more tedious, less, uh, less intuitive process of painting. Um, I, do, I use photographs a lot for reference anyway to make sure I'm getting the details right, but for a bird that I know well, a lot of, my, a lot of what I'm painting is just what I visualize um, myself. So, but to name a couple of species that I'm particularly anxious to see that I haven't yet seen, um, Aztec thrush, which is a Mexican species that's occurred in Arizona quite a few times, and I've, I've missed it by 24 hours three or four times. Um, and um, Faya's petrel is another uh, high on my list that's a nests in the eastern Atlantic and is seen every year now off of Cape Hatteras in the Gulf Stream. But um, that's a pretty recent discovery that they're being seen out there. But thanks. Yep. Hi. Um, I live on, on the eastern shore at the tip of the Delmarva Peninsula, and I do most of my bird watching on my morning runs. And I had a question the other day. Uh, why is the egret white? All of the other water birds that I see are brown or gray or brown and white or gray and white, but the egret is so bright in the sky and along the shoreline, and I was just wondering what the, what the reasoning behind that would be as far as yeah. Pred pred predation. Yeah, um, that, uh, there are many, many fascinating questions just like that <laughs> waiting. <laughs> waiting for someone <laughs> to come along to try to answer them. Um, and yeah, it's interesting that quite a few of the herons and egrets are white, and some of them, like reddish egret, has both a white morph and a dark morph. The same species can be white or dark. And I don't actually know if, if anyone has tested, has done a study to see if there's a difference in where they forage or when they're better, that's, I think one of the theories I've heard is that white birds might be less visible to fish, because the, most of them are hunting fish that are below them in the water. So the egret's neck sort of hanging out over the water is to gonna be visible to the fish, and that maybe a white neck is harder for the fish to see, um, but there must be other times when dark plumage is better, or maybe it doesn't make any difference and there's some other reason that they're I thought maybe it had to white. do with the, um, maybe color blindness of some of the predators, I don't know. Um, they can't see the white. <laughs> yeah, well that, and yeah, we don't know whether it's something to help them, to hide them from fish or prey, or to hide them from predators, or to just maybe to make them more, more attractive to other egrets. Okay, um, thank you. Keep thinking on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Sorry. I don't mean to ask you an embarrassing question, but <laughs> in terms of the bird guides that are extant now, including yours, which is wonderful, if you were a birder, other than yourself, and you wanted to get maybe three guides, would you, you, you know that there's photographic guides and there, there are different approaches. Do you, yeah. What do you think about the different approaches just generally to bird guides? And can you give advice to those of us who are looking to purchase them, besides yours? <laughs> well, I have several books. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't 
don't know each other, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, uh, the debate over photos versus illustrations um, is, will, will continue. Um, uh, to me, as I've described a little bit here, uh, in the illustrations, I can, um, I can emphasize the, the key points and strip away everything else so that um, you're only seeing the in information that's really important. And a photograph is just a complete record of that bird at that instant. So, but the benefits of photographs is um, that uh, it shows you exactly what that bird looks like at that moment. So I would supplement my book with um, a, a photographic field guide. And there's quite a few. Um, out there, and new ones coming out all the time. Um, so I won't single one out, but there, um, there are some very good photographic guides. Um, and I will recommend, well, actually, a, a book that really inspired me for the artwork is Lars Johnson's Birds of Europe. Um, it was published in the 1990s, published in the US by Princeton University Press. Um, just fantastic artwork. It's not a fantastic field guide, but the artwork is just glorious. And um, uh, so that's, um, I, I, I will recommend that for the artwork. And there's a, a newer book, oh, um, a new book that just came out this year called Rare Birds of North America, um, published by Princeton as well. And that, um, that covers all of the species that have been recorded in North America that aren't included in my book. <laughs> so my book covers over 800 species, but leaves out the very rarest of the rare, the species that have only been recorded three or four times or fewer five times. So um, to get information on all of those, there's a, an excellent new book called Rare Birds of North America. So you say basically what I think I'm if I can synopsize you, it would be most helpful to have your guide, which, which for the bird watcher says, okay, you want to see what five things on that bird to identify it as such a bird. And, but the photographic guide also is helpful in that it looks like that. Yeah, it's helpful to have the photographs. So once you've, you think you've identified the bird, look at the photographic guide and see what some photographs look like to have that multiple different viewpoints. My book includes my, my own particular um, vision of those species. It's my interpretation of what a robin looks like. And so having multiple field guides is always a good idea to compare different, different artists' interpretations or different photographs to get a broader um, picture of what that bird might look like. Well, thank you for justifying me spending the money on multiple field guides. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.